Hello, my name is Colin Goldberg, and today is Friday, February 3rd, 2023. That's 2323. Um, I'm here today with artist Vernada Lights, and um, we're going to be having a little conversation. And I'm going to start out with some um, general questions. Um, Vernada, could you tell us a little bit about your background, um, such as where you were born, where you live and practice now, and your cultural influences? Oh, certainly. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today, Colin. Um, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, I currently live and practice and grew up in Port Royal, South Carolina. Um, both areas, uh, both places are part of the Carolina, South Carolina Low Country, and uh, it is known to be the home of the Gullah Geechee Nation, um, which is a community and a nation actually of African Americans whose ancestry dates back to the times of slavery, shadow slavery here in the United States. And it involves geographically the coastal areas from Greenville, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida. And the <clears throat> Blacks, of course, were brought here as forced laborers um, to run the indigo, rice, and cotton plantations that built so much of the wealth of the American South and of the nation as a whole. And actually when combined with the Caribbean um, plantations and other areas, such a system actually built the wealth of Europe and the United States that would last four centuries. Could you talk a little bit about your um, cultural influences? I know that you had told me some of your stories um, uh, related to musicians and specifically some of the jazz musicians that I'm a big fan of. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Okay, okay. Well, let me say a little bit more about uh, being Gullah. Being Gullah means okay. that we have African retentions in our culture and that influences music, visual art, because there's Gullah art, which is a genre of art. And it also influences um, our crafts, um, rag quilts and whatnot. Um, the African attitude, attitude towards art is that art should be utilitarian. So we see here in the West that there's art for art's sake, but the African concept of art um, from time immemorial and which has flowed over into the low country as African retention is that art should be functional. So um, my art and artistic influence color wise is infused with this philosophy that the art must do something. So um, I started uh, creating art because I needed to make sense of what was happening to the changing world. Um, I had retired from the practice of medicine and 9-11 happened. And um, I had had a series of dreams, uh, premonitions actually, that such an event would occur here in the United States. And it was, was you know, um, somewhat rattled by being thrown into that reality unexpectedly. And I needed to de-stress from the, the trauma of going from one profession into another and not quite knowing um, what was going to happen, you know, in the future. And then to be, um, have to work through or process the dangers, the nascent dangers of um, terrorism. I had to process that as a uh, citizen and as, as a physician also. And I had an experience as a poet I had published a book of poetry titled Dog Moon. It's published by uh, Sunbury Press in Brooklyn, New York. And um, I tried writing poetry about it and it, 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 I couldn't find the words. All I could write was, the one sentence I wrote was, there are no words for this. And so I was you know, basically stuck and stumbled upon um, graphic design programs in my brother's computer. And uh, the paint, you know, it's rinky dink, but it opened the window to 16 million different colors. And that intrigued me scientifically. How can such a small thing open up this 
diaspora of uh, colors yeah, and in a way that was totally unrelated to what I knew of an artist studio. You know, we're not talking paints and fumes and turpentine and brushes. And my art, artist friends had um, bemoaned the fact of how expensive it was to be an artist. And I once encountered a brush that cost 80 bucks. And that was like totally ridiculous. But I, I was fascinated by the fact that this was free. It was already inside the computer. I didn't have to pay a fee for it. And I decided to explore it and in the process. I um, found the colors and I created shapes and initially abstract art um, tiles and textile designs, what I focused on uh, because I wanted the art to be useful, not just to de-stress me, but to actually be something applicable. But at that point in time, the designs that I, I created, there was not a technology that I knew of that would allow me to actually create the product that I envisioned. Nonetheless, I kept um, the images that I created and created um, a collection that I titled Beauty for Ashes. And it was a 9-11 art memorial. And I have some of those, at least one of those images to show to you. And later on, I segued from doing textile designs and um, tile designs into doing faces when I encountered um, caregiving stress. I grew older, retired from the practice of medicine, of course, and then in the process of finding out what I was going to do um, after medicine, I um, understood and thought about and pondered and meditated on what would happen to my parents who were you know, aging. And I had a brother who had a, a disability. And I made up my mind to put myself in a position where I could help them as they grew older and faced various infirmities, which indeed did happen. So that was another way of becoming useful. And in the process of doing that, I encountered stress and I also needed to document what was happening because the caregiving situation is uh, something where there's rapid changes taking place. And I needed to document that. And I started to then focus on faces. Um, again, the art becoming functional, not only to make it complex and multifaceted to document uh, many aspects of the story in a single image, but also to um, relieve stress you know, be personally valuable, and also to document my, uh, my culture and what was happening to my family. So my culture pretty much uh, influenced me to find ways to use art, you know, not just to do art for art's sake, but how is this going to be useful for me? Um, and also we have the color, the aspect of color and how I use shapes and whatnot that are involved. Um, the Gullah, culture um, also um, allowed me to think holistically. Um, in Western civilization, there's either or dichotomy set up. Either you do this or you do that. Um, I you know, didn't really agree with all of that, which is why, why, why when I was in medical school, I continued writing poetry and performing poetry because to me, art is a medicine and medicine is an art. And words are medicines. Um, you can say something to somebody that can make them very angry. And there's a whole host of chemical reactions that cascade from that interaction, from what you hear. Um, you can say loving words to someone and release a whole flood of positive uh, hormones that give you positive feelings and whatnot. So um, that to me meant that you had to, as a physician, embrace all these aspects in the process of becoming a doctor. So um, I had that holistic vision and, um, and as I, my artistic career evolved, 
I continued to see the medicinal, the healing, the synthesis, and whatnot. And that likewise is um, a Gullah influence, is an African retention that gave me that philosophical focus. It made it possible for me to remain balanced on stage, performing with the band and working with Philadelphia jazz musicians, you know, and also um, while in a clinical setting. You know, it was challenging, no doubt about it. It was very challenging, but it allowed me to express myself in a way that I otherwise would not have had, you know, because doctors just don't cut loose. You know, they don't get, they don't get <laughs> on stage and, you know, and dance and they don't have conga players and drummers, you know, and, and, and string players and saxophones going and dancers moving around and, and interacting. They don't do these things. But as Ricky Lights, which was my um, poetic persona, I was able to um, feel comfortable in my own skin and to carry those lessons that I learned on stage and interacting with people in the public back into the uh, clinical setting. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and really interesting, um, kind of like, uh, you know, transition from one profession into another. Was there any particular um, event that made you say, you know, I want to be an artist or a specific point in time where you really made a decision to to make a change in sort of how you um, identified maybe or how you went about your day? Mm -hmm. Well, when I was 10 years old, when I was three years old, I told my parents I was, I was going to be a doctor. Okay. I had never seen a black physician. I had never seen uh, a black nurse. My dad was in the Marine Corps. I had asthma, so I saw a lot of doctors, but they were all white and I didn't really see women um, nurses. I saw corpsmen, okay? So they were like male nurses, so to speak. And, um, but I knew I was gonna be a physician and I knew it was possible, there's no doubt in my mind. And throughout school, I was very dedicated to my studies because I knew that I had to do well in school in order to go to medical school. And that was my goal. Um, when I was 10 years old, I told my parents that, you know, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna be a writer. And uh, they went with that too. No one ever told me you can't be doing all of this. They, they didn't tell me, you're a little black girl, you can't be a doctor. Um, they didn't say, um, we don't know any writers or we can't help you whatnot. I had siblings, six siblings. And I became acquainted with the world of poetry, you know, people, traditional poets like Edgar Allan Poe and, um, and James Weldon Johnson. And I started to write poetry when I was in high school and I became the um, copy editor for the yearbook. So I guess that was my first published poetry, but I always saw it as being part of myself you know, something that I needed to um, express. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And um, who do you think um, would be your um, primary influences if you had to identify um, as far as artistic influences go? You know, I collected art before I became an artist. I was an a patron of the arts. Okay. And in my practice, um, I, be, I had many artistic friends, you know, as a poet from my med school years and my, and my Bryn Mawr years. And um, I knew that they had a hard way to go financially. And I was also sensitive to the needs of musicians and whatnot because of my uh, involvement with the Philadelphia jazz musicians who introduced me to the, the world of performance poetry. And I saw how they struggled. And I understood that jazz giants such as John Coltrane had passed away perhaps unnecessarily. Coltrane had a stroke, he had high blood pressure, you know, so he was stressed. Um, so, you know, it's, they, impressed upon me the need to do something about it. 
So what I would do is I knew that many of the artists did not have insurance and could not afford my services out of pocket. So I allowed them to put their, hang their artwork in my practice. And that became their insurance policy. The artwork that was hanging in my practice allowed them to come and see me and get treatment just like anybody else. And when the artwork came down, if they didn't replace it, fine. You know, sometimes I had to plead to hold on to some of the parts that were, were, were favorites of mine. But I, I, would, I would say that I was influenced by the music scene in Philadelphia. Unbeknownst to me, it had translated into a visual impulse of sorts. And certainly these musicians, they, they were so heavy and I used to sit down and talk to them about the music. It was never just music, it was the music, okay? And um, they had mathematical formulas and philosophies about music and what it's about and, and how it affects the, the world around you, the cosmos, so to speak. There were people like Sun Ra, you know, Bootsy Barnes. I mean, so I was influenced by the funk, which was Gullah, you know, the basic drum beat, but also the, the Philadelphia jazz men. And I would um, add that I was influenced philosophically um, by the other artists in the Philadelphia area because they had a very deep love for people. And they translated this into incredible works on canvas. You know, the Church of the Advocate at um, 18th and Diamond Streets was the heart of North Philadelphia, very hard, hard, hard ghetto, you know, situation, um, had uh, Jazz Vespers, and they also had the sanctuary itself um, function as an art gallery, which is another ma manifestation of the functionality of art attitude that comes from, you know, having an African heritage, so... So I would say those were two major influences. I, I can't single out any one particular mm -hmm. person. I can't say Romare Bearden influenced me, although I, you know, admired his work. Um, and I have artist friends who were definitely influenced by him and mentored by him. But I did not have that um, particular experience. But I would say the philosophy, I absorbed something in the ether. Mm. Okay. That allowed me to, when I saw color, all of a sudden, you know, this other thing just started happening. Mm -hmm. mm. Huh. Interesting. Okay, so before we, um, you know, look at your work, um, would you want to speak to your process a little bit in terms of, I'm sure there's different sort of streams of consciousness as when you're making work, but. Um, yeah, sort of... it is. Um, well, when I started, I didn't know what I was doing. I was not computer literate, okay? I had to teach myself to become computer literate. So I dissected software programs like uh, Paint, Paint Shop Pro, um, also um, Photoshop. I dissected their command structure and then experienced what each thing, each instrument, each tool and its parameters was capable of doing. It's an interesting choice of words, uh, <laughs> dissected, <laughs> coming from a uh, yeah, I dissected. retired physician. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to dissect it. I had to, one thing at a time. It seen these little trees of influences like nerves and tendrils going out into other commands and interacting and whatnot. And um, I sat down and with the canvas, the blank electronic canvas and picked colors that went, mm, you know, it had to have a vibe with it. So I moved the cursor around until like something showed up in the little box that went, and I, and I was like, okay, that's it. Okay. Do you listen to music when you work visually? No, no I don't. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> But that is not to say musical processes aren't going on, but gotcha. it it resonates, okay? And I select the colors and then I started random placements. 
and applying shapes and lines and and I sort of just fugue out in front of the electronic canvas. And um, it, there's a flow. And early on, I likened using computer software programs um, to uh, Vulcan mind meld from Star Trek. You know, mm -hmm. my mind to your mind, my thoughts to your thoughts. <laughs> right. I would get really close to the computer and in a way project and try to feel what was coming back at me. And I do believe that these uh, programs, many of them are intuitive and you can't have intuitive programs um, unless there's something to intuit from. So that would mean that my mind is being involved. So since like 2000, which was when I be became an artist, evolved into an artist, um, I have been aware that um, we do communicate with uh, the digital realm when we, when we create art. So in that process, um, I wait what's going on, the feedback in terms of color, shape, form, and dynamic, and um, I shape from that. Um, when I started creating uh, 2D artworks on canvas, paper, and whatnot, I um, would start off initially also with color. And I just put the color wherever, okay? And then I would take my tongue blade <laughs> and move the, the acrylics or you know, the oil around. And then just sort of in a process, add color, 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 and then stop. And I hang it up facing east, west, okay, from a window that goes east, west. Mm -hmm. And I'd watch the sun rise and set on it, rise and set. And in the process of that rising and setting, different shapes became visible within the paint that was put on the canvas. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes those shapes told a story. And I would take my um, charcoal and outline the story and sometimes ink and create the visual um, on the paper or on the canvas. And uh, I found that process very gratifying, you know, very soothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, would you wanna show us a little bit of your work and if through a screen share and um you know sure, sure. Um, show us how it evolved um sort of both artistically and technically well um I'm, i should add before we do that that i'm my current project um gully me 2.0 is an nft project mm -hmm. and i use artificial intelligence uh software on uh, dal e and i also use night cafe I found um, mid-journey problematic, so I, I I shied away from that. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can start to hold on a second. Okay, share my screen. Okay. Are you seeing it? I am. Okay. Well, here we have um, Pearl of Great Price. And um, it's part of the Beauty for Ashes 9-11 Art Memorial. And um, I created it because um, the whole, you know, 9-11 uh, terrorism um, disaster in this destruction of the World Trade Center and the attacks on the Pentagon and whatnot. 
um, was a wanton um, destruction of life. But we were attacked and subjected to this murderous uh, act um, in the name of religion. So I figured that the response to what had happened should likewise have a sacred subtext. So the Pearl of Great Price is from one of Jesus's parables that are told in the gospel, wherein he talks about a merchant who was seeking a Pearl of Great Price. And he searched and searched and searched until he found it. <clears throat> and once he found it, he took it, liquidated all his assets, so to speak, and purchased it, took all that he had in order to have this pearl of great price. And in the parables, the pearl of great price um, represents humanity. You know, the John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we are the pearl of great price. And therefore every human being is a pearl of great price. So um, here um, we have the, the pearl that's still basically inside the clamshell, which is symbolized by the yellow and the glow here. And this is the a point of attachment where the, can, um, the clam would be. But the color and the shine, I really um, can't even um, explain how it got there. Um, because the program that I was using, Paint Shop Pro, um, really, um, you know, was limited in that regard. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, what I did was I rubbed the mouse back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, as if I wanted to polish something. And somehow the, uh, that translated into many, many, many different movements on the canvas. And when the movement stopped, um, this is what was uh, visible. Um, the Pearl of Great Price uh, was a finalist in the Boston Cyber Arts Festival um, 2003 and is a permanent part of the Field of Vision New York City 9-11 tribute. Um, so here's that. Nice, beautiful. Thank you. This is my first um, digital painting, and it's titled An American Girl. I did it in 2003. At that point in time, I had uh, signed up for graphic design classes, painting classes, and whatnot, um, because as a digital artist, I knew that the digital piece was going against the grain for um, the arts community, which can be very staid. And I anticipated that, um, oh, they're going to get you, you know, they're going to come at you. <laughs> so in order to not get got <laughs> by traditionalists, I signed up for all these classes. And in the process, I was working with this as I started it. I did not know about layers in Photoshop at that point in time. So everything I did was done directly on the canvas, the electronic canvas. And here we see my um, a dear friend's daughter um, who had a collection of American Girl dolls. And, uh, and of course, um, there aren't many American Girl dolls that, or dolls in general that are um, little girls or little boys who are black, you know, melanated. So um, I wanted to uh, pay tribute to my friend's daughter, who here is posed as a flower girl for uh, a wedding, um, and her fondness for the American Girl uh, doll line. So, uh, you know, painting her, her skin and dealing with her eyebrows and lashes was exceedingly challenging um, because, you know, I had no no format uh, from which to work. So I just used the one pixel, you know, brush size. Wow. And did their brows 
hair by hair, you know, magnified it really big and did the brows hair by hair, added the lashes and, and whatnot and the edges of her hair. And then doing the boundaries, I did the boundary in Photoshop, which, you know, might be pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. So, right, so there's that. And here we have one of the um, artworks from the World Invisible uh, series. The World Invisible talks about um, or pictures, it depicts history. It makes history present in the atmosphere. And um, so it's like how people think of ancestors. Um, or historical beings that uh, give you a heritage. And for me, um, it, um, having grown up in a Christian household and being a Christian myself, um, many of these uh, paintings are infused with biblical themes. I did not start out to create it as such, but it was what I saw. When I, I told you about how I apply the paint and then the, watch the sun rise and set and the figures sort of emerge from the painting itself. And here we have a story, um, a garden story, and basically it tells the fall of man, you know, and we have individual faces here. We have um, Eve in the garden, you know, the garden is deteriorating. It looks like things are basically um, rotting and no longer in bloom. And uh, here we see a portrait of the, the Trinity is sort of presented like a Rubik's cube, you know, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. You know, if you can see it almost rotated here in the corner. Um, and you see the blue and the flowers and the, the animal faces and whatnot. Here we go. And it's um, um, acrylic and oil, ink and marker uh, on paper, measures 18 by 24 inches. And here we have Angels on Assignment, um, which is another part of the World Invisible series. Um, you don't see it with your naked eye, but you, you know we're told that we have angels all around us. And um, this is a depiction of that. But what I want to do is show that there's the atmosphere. So you see like the cloud-like effects here and here. And it's almost like you're in an airplane or in an aerial perspective looking down. And you, you see the different colors that could be like the landscaping below when you're flying over a field of say, um, of crops mm -hmm. or a village, something like that. And you see the geographic uh, demarcations and the, the uh, water and whatnot. So you have the air and the land and in between are these beings who are, you know, winged. Some of them look like they, they have a serious case of the blues and others are just uh, very intent on going about their business. Some in contemplation, you see the, the garments are elaborately decorated and whatnot, so yeah. So there's wow. that. So that those are early works. They were done um, from between 2001 and 2003. So I'm going to stop screen sharing here, and we can talk a little. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what is it that interests you about expressionism, and how did you sort of come to find out about it? Um, Yes, um, to expressionism um, is basically, it, it describes what I've become 
I mean, when I was dissecting a computer and making art and had no other way to make art, that to me says to expressionism. And um, of course I was involved in social media and on Instagram and whatnot. And in the process, I got a, um, a message from you about the group and uh, introducing me to the concept of text expressionism and um, asking me to, you know, attend the salons and whatnot. And I said, okay, this sounds cool. I need a community. Community is good because I come from a small community. So I know what community can do for you. So I, I attended the salons, you know, and I said immediately, okay, this is me. So I'm going to plug in and see what happens, you know? So um, the text expression is community. I find them to be very bright, very, very smart people um, with a, a wide variety of experiences that they bring to the table. And many have been long acquainted with text expressionism, like, you know, dating from the 60s and the 70s and whatnot. And I also am impressed by the um, deep involvement in technology, that you have people who not only use technology for art, but they read science fiction. And, you know, I'm a Trekkie from way back. I love science fiction. And uh, so you see, see this secondary layer of literary um, expertise that pertains to uh, technology and uh, a curiosity, a very healthy curiosity, and a, a willingness to share and learn together. So it's a great adventure. We, you know, it's a good community to have, and I'm glad to be on the set. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's great to have you. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what kind of work are you um, working on currently? Or are you, do you have anything that you'd like to share with us sure, um, have, from what you're working on now? Yeah, I have uh, AI work. Um, because the AI um, has a lot of intrinsic bias in it. It doesn't do well with depicting um, melanated uh, uh, faces. It does not do well with women. You know, basically, if you're a white man or, or an object, you can fare quite well in, <laughs> with AI. Um, and when I got all these distorted images, when I... Um, use prompts that pertain to being African-American, I uh, said, you know what, this is not good. But in my culture, you know, the Gullah culture, um, in Gullah art, um, faces are not really relevant oftentimes. Traditional Gullah art is aniconic. That is, you have a scene, it's often bucolic, you know, uh, very uh, nature oriented. Um, peaceful, loving, joyous, and prosperous, um, sort of plantation-like feeling. Uh, but the faces are absent. And um, I decided to lean into the aniconic quality of Gullah art in dealing with um, my NFT collection, Gullah Me 2.0. Uh, when they gave me, when the AI gave me a face that was not, um, something that I could deal with. It could not be easily corrected or anything like that or enhanced. Um, I just would just smooth the face out and shape the pigment um, pixel by pixel until I had the effect that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I can, um, let me locate here. Righty. Okay, let me share my screen here. Okay, are you seeing the Gullamy two point? zero NFT presentation. 
Let's see. Yep. Okay. All right. So it's a slide um, show and um, it has music and whatnot. So, I, but I'm going to walk through it um, in, you know, singularly. And could you tell, before you start, could you tell a little bit about the origin of the word gala and where that comes from? Well, gala, um, it is speculated because, you know, gala is just now in, it, in the 20th and the 21st century starting to be written. Um, it is uh, theorized that the word gala um, is evolved from Angola, that uh, many of the early um, Gullah ancestors were brought from the Angola area and, um, and that Angola became Nagola and from Nagola, Gullah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, I'm a big uh, interest in etymology and I think it's always interesting to see where things come from. So thanks yeah. for that. Sure, sure. Um, and that's a really powerful image. I mean, just the completely negative space there where the the figure's face is it's really powerful. And iconic, you know, mm -hmm. um, because the um, Dal E, which is the software that I use, um, could not give me a, a face that I could um, use as an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it did great with the moss and whatnot, which I added mm -hmm. my own painting touches to it. Well, what I did was I just, you know, leaned into the gala um, quality of aniconic faces and decided to just deal with that. Um, and it worked. And mm -hmm. here the indigo head wrap she has. Indigo was um, a dye that was grown on the plantations um, here in the South. And the Gullah Me 2.0 tells my dad's history and in telling my, the, the history of my father, whose uh, portrait is there, which you know, I also did as a photo restoration that I did of him. Um, it tells his story of growing up poor and, and his uh, life as a soldier. He was a Marine. Um, and in the process of telling his story, I tell the history of, of, of the culture of my people so that um, people will be aware that my people exist because uh, we, we are under threat of uh, cultural extinction due to gentrification and um, uh, a paucity of opportunities for young people, uh, which gives very little incentive to stay in the area, you know? So um, hoping that making, creating awareness and knowledge uh, would work and also putting the story on the blockchain gives it um, a chance at a permanence that it would not ordinarily have um, because, you know, books are being banned and for, you know, we don't want to hear about that. We're uncomfortable, whatever, you know, and all of a sudden your book is no longer available, but you can't do that with the blockchain, you know? Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, well, then this, this NFT thing is what we're going to be doing here from now on. <laughs> Okay, so here we um, discussed, you know, that I am Gullah, and here we have another an iconic rendering, and the water, which you know is done by hand. The clouds in the sky are truly a South Carolina. Uh, these are South Carolina clouds and sky uh, mm -hmm. from photos that I took um, of the Carolina sky overlooking my family home. And um, many of these uh, background photos were taken while my father was still alive. So here we have a, a young woman. Uh, she's presumed to be a slave, aniconically rendered, and she's at the water edge, um, possibly contemplating uh, her future. You have many scenes like this in the Low Country, um, because it is, you know, low country and there's the Atlantic Ocean right there and the Beaufort River and we have lots of uh, pockets of water and we have salt marshes, uh, muddy salt marshes um, all around the area um, that give it a, a particular smell and, and feel.
And here we see the doll E rendering of what a three-year-old <coughs> Uh, black boy would look like. Um, there were problems with the face, but I was able to correct it using Photoshop. Uh, my dad picked cotton for 10 cents per pound when he was three years old, and he was hungry a lot. They were very poor, and when the soles of his shoes wore out, he replaced them with cardboard and newspaper, and he often bemoaned um, uh, his poverty while growing up and was determined that his children would not suffer a similar fate. Um, here we have, again, the Carolina sky and the clouds that I blended in with the um, artwork, the Dali artwork. And I also had to hand, um, hand paint additions to the cotton to give it a more realistic feel. And here we have where my, my dad um, grew up in a, uh, you know, not really a bedroom to call his own. He slept on a straw mattress and there were holes in the roof. And when it rained, he got wet, it rained in his room. Hmm. And um, I had to create animate the rain here. Let's see if you, let me know if you can hear it, okay? Okay. <laughs> Yep. Okay, and here we have where he dropped out of school in the third grade because he was embarrassed by poverty and discouraged by hunger. Um, here we have um, him uh, walking away from the schoolhouse, you know, very primitive. And he's wearing clothes that belong to a neighbor. He wanted to look really nice on his last day of school. And, but his friend was bigger than he was. So the clothes are a bit too big. The clothes are baggy, the shoes are too large. Um, but he had a good feeling about himself on his last day of school. And here we have him walking on the grass. And the grass is a, a grayscale um, image of the grass from um, our yard and in areas that dad actually walked on, you know, when he uh, was alive. It really, um, the, the quality of the um, rendering, it reminds me of like an aqua tint or some sort of traditional media. And it's mm -hmm. interesting to see that juxtaposed with the, uh, you know, the sort of photographic uh, grass. Yes, yes, I, I wanted it, the grass to look to be real. Mm -hmm because the story is real. You know, it, it started off, the story started off as oral, oral history, but the oral history is now transitioning to become very fixed, you mm -hmm. know? So um, it's my way of uh, representing that movement into, from the ether, so to speak, um, mouth to mouth um, into the three-dimensional world. And here we have um, a photo montage I titled um, Patriarch and Home. And uh, that is the photo that I restored. It was badly, badly damaged. And I um, replaced the injured parts pixel by pixel, which is something I became greatly acquainted with when I started off mm -hmm. on this journey of being a digital artist. You know, they now have auto automated functions that get rid of scratches and whatnot, but I, I prefer to do it like I'm in the operating room, you know, like I'm suturing a wound and mm -hmm. pixel by pixel, fill it in so that it blends and um, you, you erase the, the defect. And so it's like my dad's spirit in front of the homestead, which is where I currently live. And, you know, the trees in the background, you see some of the sky that um, function as a backdrop for some of the um, the paintings you saw earlier. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, really so cool to see that. 
Yeah, Galami 2.0. And you can um, read more about Galami 2.0 and see the original Galami series at uh, galami.com, G-U-L-L-A-H-M-E.com. And also sign up for uh, notices about when the collection is going to drop. Uh, there are many, 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 many more images. Um, I just shared a few, but um, they're not live yet on the blockchain. And when they do drop, uh, I will be sending people who sign up uh, a notice to let them know when it goes live. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, before the last question, there's a, sort of a set of questions that serves as a template. There was a story that you had told me um, recently about your first uh, museum exhibition that I thought was very powerful. Um, and I was wondering if you'd want to share that or some sort of version of that for the this interview. Yes, well, um, I had I was asked to be a part of this exhibit called Portraits Americana that was curated by photographer Glenn Rand. And it was to take be uh, placed at the Albrecht Kempner Museum of Art in uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. And I had never been to Missouri before and I was very excited because there were people like um, uh, Stieglitz, you know, Alfred Stieglitz mm -hmm. and whatnot in the show. And to be with art, artistic luminaries or photographic luminaries dating back a hundred years was um, a big deal. And the things that I had worked on um, were considered to be the future of where um, photography would be headed, photographic portraits uh, would be headed. So I was all excited. It was the winter, it was November of 2018. And um, I found out that um, it was the midst of a lot of crises, um, uh, police brutality and deaths of unarmed black men were occurring in 2017, 2018. And I was preparing to travel at that point in time. And the precariousness of my situation as a black woman um, was brought to the forefront when in the process of planning to go to St. Joseph, Missouri, I found out that there had been a lynching um, two days before I was due to uh, arrive. So I wow. mean, I, I was really, really, really um, anxious about that and um, didn't know what to do. Uh, um, so I called my older brother, you know, he has a very um, uh, boots on the ground attitude toward life, you know, he doesn't play not like my dad got that military vibe and everything. And he reminded me, he said, well, you know, you don't have to go. You don't have to go, you know, stressing that I had an option, um, which is something that many black people in my position didn't have a lot of back in the day, right? So I said, okay, I could not go. So that's the first decision, will I go? Am I gonna back out because of this? Cause the show is gonna go on, the work is gonna be up. But am I going to um, stop myself from experiencing the opening reception because of this event? Then I made some phone calls um, and the museum and the people involved with it knew nothing about all the stuff that was going on in the outside world. And they could not help me um, with respect to finding a place to stay that was safe. So. I opted to find out where the curator was staying. And he was a white male, so I figured, okay, <laughs> wherever he's staying must be safe <laughs> because that's just the lay of the land, okay? He's gonna be in the best spot. So I found out where he was staying and I booked a location there. And, um, and I thought about packing and it was like, you know, freezing in Missouri at that time of year. And I'm in South Carolina, it was relatively warm. You know, it doesn't get that cold here. And um, I had this large mink coat. That was the only coat I had that would hold up under that kind of cold. And I said, okay, I'm gonna have to take the mink. 
Uh, but then I thought about, oh my goodness. All right, this is a it's floor length, very expensive. And it's gonna put a um, target on my back. I mean, am I gonna get stopped by police? Am I gonna have someone in the um, museum call the man on me or something like that? Because <laughs> they think I stole something, <laughs> you know? I was upset about that. And I said, you know what? This really is not fair. This is an unfair burden to be on me. I'm, I'm supposed to be able to enjoy having my first museum exhibit. I need to be able to be free to enjoy the fruits of my labor and to network with like-minded individuals, which this opportunity has afforded me and not have to worry about, am I gonna die or get shot or sent to prison because I have on an expensive coat. The coat costs something like 10 grand, okay? Mm. So is this going to get me in trouble? And I said, you know, it was so stressful. And then I spoke with my younger brother um, who has a, a, a more faith-based approach, much, much like myself. And he said, well, you know, you think about how the um, black groups of the 60s how they made it traveling through the South, you know, the Temptations and the Supremes, uh, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, they talk often in their memoirs and in their interviews about how threatened they were physically while performing or, or even just traveling through the South. And I thought again, you know, that is such an unfair burden because being creative is enough to be responsible for, you know, to conceptualize this artwork and to bring it into fruition and have the, the uh, resources necessary to make it a reality. And then on top of that, you figured because I've done this, you know, well, I could um, possibly lose my life mm -hmm. behind a misunderstanding related to uh, the color of my skin. So, so it was rough. So I, in my prayers, I remembered to um, that I had a neighbor who was a soldier. And uh, the women in my community are like the Dora Milaje, you know, from uh, the Black Panther movies. Um, they, they are fierce and it's a military community. So to have a neighbor that I grew up with who was a soldier, you know, she did time in the army not the cushy Air Force, the Army, you know. <laughs> she was a real soldier, you know. And um, I told her about my situation. And she said, look, Ricky, you know, it's my nickname, Ricky. We're going to, um, my husband and I will come get you at the airport. And we'll take you to the hotel. And you know what? We'll go to the exhibit with you and take you back to the airport when it's time for you to go home. You'll be all right. You know, and and I was moving through the airport when I landed. Uh, the only people of color were the people who were busting the floors, you know, and uh, it was it was a deep moment. And um, when I saw her and her husband, I was so happy. And she she took control of the situation. She's such a soldier. Oh my goodness, she's retired now, but she just moved through that crowd. Like it was, like the way it had been paid. I got to the hotel, it was no big deal, got settled in. And when, when showtime came, she was there and I had on my mink. <laughs> there you go. I had my mink on. And uh, at that, by that point in time, I was fearless. But the memory of that stress lingers. It, it is difficult. <sighs> You know, it's, it's a difficult world we live in, but you have to be brave. It takes courage, you know. And what year was this? This was. This uh, was 2018. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is present day, you know, it's just uh, very. Less than five years ago, really. Because mm -hmm. it was November 2018. Mm -hmm. so, so four years, yeah. a couple of months. So for those of you who, who don't have such concerns, it's called privilege, okay? 
privilege. Be thankful. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, thank you for sharing that um, that story. Um, and the the sort of last question that I'm going to wrap up with um, is, how do you see the future of art? Well, I I think that art is at a crossroads. It's at a crossroads, I think, because of the artificial intelligence. Because mm. um, some of the work produced by AI is very good very good and so now um, artists are going to have to rethink their relationship with the instruments um, before our instruments were our tools um, before software our tools were inanimate the paintbrush is inanimate you know a pencil is inanimate um, we control it with our hand it, it moves at our will it goes where we want it to go AI is not like that, you know, AI is, um, has a mind of its own, literally. So now we have to determine how we're going to interact with it, um, not just for visuals, but also for the, uh, for writing component, because we have to write a lot in um, handling our artwork, create explanations and, and um, discourses and whatnot. So we're going to have to reckon and uh, determine one by one how we're going to interact with this new reality that we have um, been confronted with. And I think that artists will, artists of goodwill will work to make AI more um, accountable, to be accurate and able to create a face for any human being, regardless of your ethnicity. You know, um, they should be able to render a woman's face as easily as a man's. Um, they should be able to not um, associate black skin with trash or destructive elements, you know, not be sarcastic in their rendering. So, I think that this is our time to strategize how we're going to shape the future. And of course, there are many who don't care. They just want to make money, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, I don't know who's going to win in this, this struggle. But I do hope and pray that it's artists of goodwill, that we will act in such a way that we have an artistic environment that is fair, fair to all, and, and as capable of responding to all as it is to a certain segment of society. All right. Well, that's um, certainly something worth um, heading towards. So um, yeah. I appreciate your time today, Vernita and um, look forward to seeing more of your work and also to our um, collaboration, which has been shaping right. up a little bit with the journal. Um, more will be revealed um, when, it, when we're, with regards to that. Um, the but, uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. it's, um, it's an ever evolving sort of uh, social sculpture that we're all part of and um, it's been really enjoyable so far. So, um, I wish you uh, a good weekend and I am going to stop recording in three, two, one and cut.